feature going. So we are now recording to the cloud for everyone who's not watching regular. Okay. Now we gotta yeah, you have to behave now. All behaving. And I was careful to not record before uh, Sam went away, obviously, because we can't have him on camera until tomorrow at seven, at five. So lots of weird rules. Also, I didn't tell you his real name. So there you go. That is his real name. Just not his real name yet. We got to change his name. Did you know about that, Ben? Did you watch the sermon this morning? Okay, so um, we have that baby. He'll be our adopted baby. Not legally finished legally, but it's Monday at five. We'll just be waiting for the court to rule in our favor for the next several months. But he will be, for all purposes, our adoptive son at that point. Um, and you'll appreciate his name, I hope. His name is Samuel Wise Carter. That's what it will be. Sam Wise Carter for reasons, obvious reasons. At least to me, obvious reasons. All right. Today we are up to talking about blame. That is, when chaos is happening around us, who do we blame? And specifically, we're talking about if God is to blame for the chaos that happens around us. And I kind of want to start that just kind of asking you all a couple questions. So is there usually a blame in your life when there's chaos around you? Like, do you feel um, a reason to blame or even a uh, blame to be found for people when they have chaos around you? Well, I used to blame other people, but most of the time now, if I have chaos going on around me, it's my own fault. Sure. What about when you're driving, not you driving right now, Chuck, but when you're on the highway, like going on a trip and there's chaos there, like who's to blame for that? I blame everything on Chuck. That's fair. Well, Easy it's how you perceive it. If you allow it to create chaos, then it's your fault. You have ah. a decision whether or not you're going to let it, how it's going to affect you. You have that decision to make. Yeah, that's good. So you could view a traffic jam, let's say, while you're on your way to vacation as either a chaotic, bad situation or more of a chaotic neutral situation. And this is pretty much where Jason needs to be chiming in a lot with his I'm little chicken here. there. I mean, let's talk to us a little bit about that. So I, I purposely use that language because I want you to willingly and will wi willingly and willfully admit your dorkdom. And I will admit mine beside you if you admit yours. And just t tell me, talk to us about the roles of chaotic characters in Dungeons and Dragons. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Jason T. Teller, and I'm a dork. Me too. <laughs> 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 so I hate to spring that on you, but tell me about like chaotic, all the chaotic characters, the roles of chaotic um, chaos in D and D. I'm I am no expert. I I, I learned the limitations of my dungeon mastery. Um, so you have chaotic, you have lawful, you're talking about like lawful good and like work the whole spectrum or? No, no, this? just just give me the chaotic spectrum. There's three, the three chaotic spectrums. The three things on that. Okay, spectrum. chaotic good or chaotic good, chaotic neutral and chaotic evil. Okay. Yep. Um, but, Basically, all of them are, are good, neutral, and evil, but for pretty much no reason at all. They're, it's kind of an absolute value kind of thing. You're good just yep. because you're good. You're, uh, you're neutral, meaning you really don't have a care in the world about anything, and your chaotic evil means you'll do random evil things without thinking about yep. it. Yeah, so no generally purpose. speaking in Dungeons & Dragons, it would be safe to say, if you created a character that was chaotic good, they would be unpredictable, but overall a good character. They'd have a good nature about them. If they're chaotic evil, they'd be unpredictable and do evil things, generally speaking. Chaotic neutral, they would do, be unpredictable 
and it just wouldn't matter. They do whatever was best for the situation around them, I think. So that's kind of the the D and D spectrum of chaos, and it's a very good spectrum because it turns out that's probably more what chaos is for all of us, right? Chaos, like we said in the first week, it's neither good nor bad, and as Diane said, it's what you make of it. So you can choose to be chaotic good, chaotic neutral, chaotic evil, or just at any point say the chaos doesn't matter. I'll just be good. It's a as Jason said, it's a very much a, a an algebraic type thing. He didn't say that. He alluded to that where you have rules, you have to follow them. It is what it is. So chaos, by and large, um, isn't, isn't necessarily good or bad, as we said, but also because it's not necessarily good or bad, is there a way to find blame in that chaos? And as you guys probably pointed out, generally that blames us, right? But that leads to a bigger question. Is there blame for the good that we have in life? like blame for the good we have in life. Like, do you guys ever have that thought? Like you're doing something in the world and you think, oh, I wonder whose fault this is. You know, um, it, I was talking just this morning to Jen and express after service and expressing my difficulty with the mother of Samuel because she introduced chaos into his world and into my world and my family's world, but it was for a good thing for us as of right now, right? So do I blame her for the good? Well, that doesn't make sense, right? It's just not her fault that good happened to me. Something happened to her and we benefited from that in a way, and so did Samuel, I would like to believe. So there's not really no one to blame for the good. If you win the lottery, are you gonna blame somebody for that? If you go play the lottery, you can blame me. I think the word you're looking for there is credit, right? Nope, it's blame. There's a reason. Okay. There's a reason. So the credit is offering, is assigning the good to something. I'm specifically talking about blaming someone for something happening to you that happens to be good, right? Getting, assigning some negative aspect to a person because of that. And of course we don't do that, right? We never do that. Yeah, it wouldn't make any sense for us to do it. So at the same token, if we can't blame someone for the good, can we credit someone for the bad? See, Jason? What do you think about that? Giving credit to the bad? I guess not. No, no. So that's, it's, it's sort of an inverse equation at this point. What I'm trying to point out is it's illogical. If it's illogical to do one for the other, then it's reflexively and using reflexive sort of properties. Not that I'm a math genius, but it's the same idea. If it's illogical to go that way. It's illogical to go the other. So part of Job is really getting at blaming someone for the bad, but it's giving credit to God for the bad at the same time. And we do that. You already unmuted, Jason. Oh, now you're remuted. There you go. <laughs> but we do that too, right? We give God credit for bad sometimes in our life. And that's not necessarily good or a bad thing. I don't, I'm not saying, not presuming to know that God is or isn't doing it. But I want to be very clear that when we do that, we're inviting, as Diane pointed out, we're inviting <laughs> chaos to sort of multiply because we start doing something that we all know not to do, which is called the blame game, right? We blame others for the bad and we praise ourselves for the good, generally speaking, right? So chaos is always bad but because it's happening to us and therefore it could never be our fault. But winning the lottery is good and it happened to us because we really decided that, you know, I have 20 extra dollars, so I'm going to play Powerball tonight. Well, that's not the way it works sometimes, right? It is what it is as many famous people like to say sometimes in inappropriate situations, but it is what it is in this case, chaos is what it is. So we have to just kind of get on from it. So if chaos is what it is, then can God be blamed for that chaos around us? What do y'all think about that? And don't be shy. Well, if you're Amish, then you believe 
that since God is sovereign and he's in control of all things, then everything is as he wills it. And so good or bad, prosperity or not, um, you leave it open, huh? bad things, challenges, whatever, blessings, you know, um, like the song says, you give and take away, right? Yeah. The Lord gives and takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord, right? And so um, I think they find great peace in having that theology, right? Yeah. Because for them, it isn't really good or bad. It is what it is. We may think it's bad. We're interpreting as bad, but God knows more than we do. We're just going to keep trusting him. So there's the trick, right? So they don't blame God necessarily as much as they assign responsibility to God. In fact, one would say they more likely credit God with control rather than blame God for the bad outcome of the situations around them, correct? Yeah, well, I was going to say about the only people I know who credit God with the bad or anyone else with the bad are passive aggressive people. Yeah. <laughs> you want to put a happy spin on that's a bad situation but they're good people yeah but but and what do they always say kyle what do they always say i don't know you know I but do god's know. got a plan oh yeah all things yeah. work together for good yep we and start I'll laying finish that, out finish that scripture you know or whatever yep we start laying out our case like we talked last week with the three friends right we're laying out our case to why we think God's allowing this bad thing to happen, which is, as Kyle just said, a passive-aggressive way of placing blame on God, in my opinion. That's just basically saying, oh, well, all things work for the good for those who love, love Jesus. God has his plan. That's a passive way of saying, I don't understand God, and I don't like it, and you don't like it, but God's doing it. Instead of saying, it's a thing. It's a thing. It's a situation in which I find myself, and I can choose to be brought down by it or i can choose to find god in it one or the other as job did at the beginning but then was convinced to not do by his friends for a little bit and we're going to be jumping really really quickly through job as we continue this discussion but at, before i do that because we're going to see this model at work through job and through my cliff notes version of job it comes with homework so job's chapters are divvied up into speakers generally speaking one person speaks and if they're speaking on topic they'll get a chapter if they're speaking just one little thing they'll get a chapter to be short like there's a couple chapters that are like a paragraph long and couples that are a page long what i want you to do after this is to go form your own opinion because this is just my opinion on chaos you need to form your own and i want you to do it by reading excuse me the friends re-attacking job so we talked, spoke last week about how the friends attack Job, right? And they come into him and say, oh, well, this is all your fault. You're doing all this, all that stuff. And we had, it, we had the youth read those um, uh, three different distinct um, characters and what they were doing. Well, they don't go away, it turns out. Those characters come back. They, they, hear, they hear everything that Job has to say and... Uh, when they do, they're, they're not real happy about it, just to tell you the truth. Um, Job eventually gets to the point of basically saying, listen, everyone's going to die. Every single one of us is going to die. We came for women. We're going to die. Um, the Lord made this happen. So just kind of don't, don't worry, freak out about it. I'm freaking out about it. And, you know, at one point saying, uh, behold, my eyes have seen all of this. My ears have heard and understood it. What you know, I also know I am not in fear to you, but I would speak to the Almighty and I desire to argue my case with God. Basically, not blaming God in any way, but de definitely saying that God's in control of this and I want to figure out why. And to that, the person he's speaking to so far at that moment um, doesn't get real, real happy, I'm sure, but he eventually chimes back after Eliphaz chimes back but you can hear you can read all that in those chapters so you're reading on 15 all the way up to where we're going to level out at like 30 something it doesn't take long it's all short but basically they all come back and they say the same thing again um eliphaz looks at him and says basically says that he uh 
is, is still thinking that he's too wise and doesn't fear God any. Um, asking, him if, asking him if he was the first man that was ever born, essentially. Um, have you ever listened to God at any point in your life? Which is pretty, pretty harsh rebuke there. And then Job, of course, answered him and answers him and basically says, you're a miserable comforter. You're not doing anything uh, that's helpful right now. And that can be yes, right? He, he hears from Bildad coming back, that Bildad reinforcing his argument from last week that God still punishes the wicked. So I don't know what to say. You're still kind of in this boat, kind of floundering because of you. And that's the response to that um, is a very, very well-known, um, beautiful response by Job, where he cries out that uh, everything that's happening is that is, it just happens. But, oh, that my words are written, he says, oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead, they were engraved in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at last he will stand upon the earth after my skin has been destroyed Yet in my flesh, I shall see God. It's a beautiful moment, right? Where Job gets past that argument. It's still fine. I mean, he's moving on. He's trying to get through these people. And so far comes back. He's still mad, right? Saying that you're still doing this wrong. You're still wicked. Sorry about it. It's still your fault. And Job begins the cycle of healing to me in one moment. It's in chapter 21. So you have to read those arguments. I want you to read those back and forth and read this, this by Job because it's a very beautiful moment in the midst of a very bad argument by Job, in my opinion. But Job comes back and says, keep listening and let this be your comfort. Bear with me and I'll speak. And after I've spoken, mock on, keep on mocking me, he says. As for me, is my complaint against man? Why should I not be impatient? Look at me and be appalled and lay your hand over your mouth. When I remember I am dismayed and shudder seizes my flesh, why do the wicked live, reach old age, and grow mighty in power? Their offspring are established in their presence and their descendants before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear, and no rod of God is upon them. And it's a beautiful moment where Joe basically is saying, oh, the wicked prosper. Don't you think that this is because of the wicked that I'm like this? Because the wicked prosper. And we kind of need to sit there just very, very briefly. And I want you guys to, to react to that. I don't want you to say any names, but if you feel like it, I want to open the floor for you to just talk about moments when you wicked people prosper. It may feel or want anything like that. But please try to keep it, by the way, Try to keep it loving <laughs> in case you want to go anywhere that might. I don't care about offending other people. I just care about hurting a, a relationship within the church if it is you want to make a statement about anything societal. Come on, wicked people. Can you repeat the whole question because you, you froze out on the art and sorry. Okay, so basically, just kind of talk about a time when you've seen a wicked person prosper or just you see you know wickedness and you see how it prospered how did it make you feel what did it make you think about god all that stuff i'll start off i'll start off so jim baker jim baker you remember jim baker right jim baker so he was not the best televangelist of the 80s um Wife Tammy Faye, popular Heritage USA, is that right? Opened a theme park in around Charlotte. Um, eventually, you know, disgraced from an affair, extramarital affair he had, which seems like all the televangelists eventually have one. But left ministry came back years later selling snake oil and survival buckets on TBN, maybe five, seven years ago. Um, this man isn't wicked necessarily, but does wicked things and they prosper him. He gets richer and richer and richer. And then I read an article last week where the dude took out like $11 million in PPP loans during coronavirus. Like he's the only employee he has. Like what, what's he need PPP loans for? So and that, my reaction is, is kind of, you know, God, why do you allow people in your name to be wicked? 
it's a hard thing for me to reconcile. What about y'all? That's my example. I think everyone who becomes famous or rich because um, who is wicked, I think there's always a reason. Usually there are people that get them there. And so usually I don't feel anything towards those people because it's not them who got them there. It's their, their supporters who got them there. Wow. That's pretty deep for an 18 year old dude. So Ben, can, can I ask for some clarification? Essentially what I hear you saying is you don't necessarily blame Jim Baker so much as all the idiots that sent him money. Yeah. Yeah. I do. Is that okay? My paraphrase, not yeah, a kind, yeah, right. not a, not a kind one, but you know, misguided people, however you want to, but those folks that sent him money were the evil ones, doing the ones doing the evil. Uh, yeah. Deep and difficult it's, an, thought. it's an interesting insight because, you know, Ben, I would say that, like, you know, I'm just going to say Grandma Smith, for lack of a name, but, you know, she's 82, she's listening to him on TV, she doesn't really know all she knows is that, you know, he's saying, we're going to go over here and we're going to minister to these kids. And she thinks, oh, I love little kids. And so she sends him 20 bucks. Is she a bad person? Is she making a bad choice? Not always, but I think, I think there's like a, um, I, don't, um, I don't think they're wicked themselves, but th that doesn't necessarily mean that the person who is receiving the the money Benefit, Jim Baker, yeah. is, is wicked. I, I think, I think really we can all put themselves ourselves in the the bad person's shoes and say like, yeah, if I were them, I would probably do the same thing too. Um, yes, yeah, that's what I took it as. This is interesting because this is what I kind of wanted this to, to, to do. So Kyle, you and I, I'm right in between the generations, but you are a little bit older than me. You're coming from a point of view that's very valid. Like I share that mentality. You can't blame grandma Smith for just wanting to support what she has been convinced is a man of God, right? And we lived through it in the 80s, and there was literally almost zero way you could know if you were Grandma Smith that he was bad. Almost zero. In the 80s. Yep. But now, 80s. if Grandma kept sending him money in the 90s, now Grandma's got a problem. Exactly. Well, and then fast forward to 2020, when Grandma can get on the internet or ask somebody who has access to the internet to figure it out, we have a different ball game. And that's Ben's point of view, I think, is that it's really easy to source anything on the internet. You know, what's the intentions? Think of um, Jerry Falwell Jr. And I don't mean to be dogging these te televangelists or Christian leaders, but I'm, but I'm doing it anyway. So, you know, he stepped down this last week and then said, no, I don't step down. And then the board was like, no, nah, you step down. And so <laughs> that was a good move by them. But the news that you heard was easily sourced by all of us who went to Liberty, by the way, and anybody who's been on the internet, in particular um, on religion subreddits, on a red site, red site called Reddit. Um, we've been talking about the pool boy for a year, year and a half on, on those groups. So I've known about the pool boy since, you know, 2018, late 2018. But now it all of a sudden comes to light and we all know it. So if I would have supported him in that interim from Ben's point of view, having known it, that would probably make me more culpable in the act of evil, right? Am I getting that right, Ben? So, I mean, that's, I, th I, think, it's, that, I think, that, it's, that's, I think that's that point. I think it's consciously supporting something that you know. Yeah. yeah, I think, and I think it's an interesting point for an intergenerational thing. So from Kyle, from your point of view, and I already know the answer to this, and this is gonna be funny. Could you support Jim Baker's ministry in the 80s? Could you make a rational support for that even today? Okay, so I would not have, and I did not. Sure, you know, no, sure. In, in that time, because, um, but I wasn't 80, I was 20, yeah. <laughs> Some, something, you know. And so we were talking about those kind of things, you know, um, you know, I'm, I'm encouraging Ben. I think I really appreciate your, your thoughts about this because, you know, it, 
what you're are you still 18 you're not 19 yet right so at 18 you know he, you're socially socially and consciously aware of what's going on and so you're making good decisions and processing things well and taking advantage of the 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 ways that you can check things out right yeah. which is different from an 80 year old that you know we didn't have the internet and she was relying on Walter Concrete Concrete on <laughs> at six, seven o'clock or six 30, you know, those kind of things. It was, it was a different ball game, but I would add that. Is the, what is it? <laughs> well, I think, I think it can, I think what the point Ben is making is really important. Oh, is it, it is a different day. Right. And so if we look at it now, uh, Jerry Falwell Jr. has, or in those in his ilk have no excuse. Right but neither do the people who arranged or made it possible for him to be where he is. Right. So yep. I think what Ben is saying, correct me if I'm wrong, is that as believers in Christ, we have a responsibility for the choices we make and we have a responsibility for um, the way that we make those kind of things possible for others. Right. Uh, an example, if I may, is someone said this to me, I think it was my trombone professor said to me, don't buy those stupid books. And I, and we were talking about every time there was a news story about something in the Middle East um, or, or something like that, you know, political thing, there was these seven or eight authors who would come out with a new book about this is the sign of the end times, right? <laughs> Jesus is coming back tomorrow. And they would sell a $22.95 book to a few million people, right? And, and, and get rich. And he was like, don't even buy those books. Don't waste your money on those books. They don't know. The Bible says they don't know. Only God knows. And I said, I appreciate that wisdom. I never bought one of those books. Never even borrowed them from the library. That's the kind of responsibility I hear you saying, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think that, uh, Ben, I'm not, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I think that that plays into what I'm talking about is that my response and why I wanted you to think this through a little bit my response to the chaos and the chaotic evil, let's say, that I see to the evil deeds of another is adding to the chaos. Whereas the point perspective of personal responsibility takes that chaos away. Now it's not chaos. I know exactly the order of events. Because chaos is just a lack of order, right? It's confusion. So I know the order of events. Grandma Smith supported that because of reason X, Y, Z doesn't really matter but shares some culpability in it just as much as I would if I were a part of that, right? And I do in Jerry Falwell's case, because I'm an alumnus from a Liberty University. So I kind of fall into that bucket where I took the good that I saw from it and put up with the bad. Everything's a decision that we make. And I think that Job kind of gets to that point when he's talking to all of his buddies and trying to defend himself from all of them where he's just basically saying, listen, man, whatever. This just doesn't make sense. And in the middle of that, though, he gets a little bit lost. And as you're reading, I want you to be sure to, to see this point. It's chapter 23 um, or so when Job starts kind of saying, I don't really know where God is. Um, he says, I go forward, but God isn't there. I go backward, but I don't perceive him. Um, you know, as in opposition to the Psalms, that, like I said this morning in my prayer, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my way in the depths, you are there. If I fly on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand your guide, will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. So the psalmist is contending that God is everywhere, where Job says, I don't see him. Where is he? I don't see him anywhere. And I think that's a really wonderful moment because we all get there. But it's the response that I want to get to. So Job goes through that. And I want you to read all that. It's your homework. See how you feel when you read, read all that stuff. And Job eventually gets to this point where he's jumping back and forth between God is nowhere, but God is incredible. You know, God is, is his majesty is just unattainable by all of us. And then, then talks about himself. And Job goes into a diatribe about himself for a little bit and that's where i want to pick up because sometimes in all the blame that we see that we we assign blame for everyone else 
we never assign blame to, our, to myself. I'm going back to that first point I made. We'll credit ourselves for the good, but we won't blame ourselves for the bad, generally speaking. And I've used this analogy a couple times about a coach, but it stands, it stands off for all of Job. The greatest coaches, the greatest teachers, the greatest mentors will let you know where you've fallen short only to let you find a way to not do that again. They won't just do it to push you down. They'll tell you where you fall short to bring you up. And Job can't quite get to that point. He just kind of keeps saying that he's not done anything wrong. Why does God not like him? Um, makes excuses for himself, just as we would, right? We all do that. And keeps going. He, he kind of closes um, by blaming everything else. And let me read a little bit of that to you. Let me get to it real quick. Um, yeah, so... He says, if I rejoiced at the ruin of him who hated me or exulted when evil overtook him, speaking of anyone that, that would speak bad of him, I have not let my mouth sin by asking for his life with a curse. If the men of my tent have not said, who is there that has not been filled with, filled with his meat? The sojourner has not lodged in the street. I've opened my doors to the traveler. I've done everything right, he's basically saying. If I have concealed my transgressions as others do, by hiding my iniquity in my heart because I stood in great fear of the multitude and the contempt of families has terrified me. So I have kept silence and do not go out of doors. Oh, that I had, that I had one to hear me. Here is my signature. Let the Lord Almighty answer me. Oh, that I had the indictment written by my adversary. Basically saying, if I would have just done something wrong, then God would have had a reason to bring this to me. And that can be us. Like sometimes when like the COVID's going on and, and we, we got the, the political turmoil in our country and the inner social stuff that's just escalating to the point of essentially really, really bad. I know that's all as far as we go with that. But it's getting to a, a really, really untenable point and being led by a lot of Christians who are misguided, by the way, in my opinion. But anyway, we're getting to this untenable point. Like we're basically getting there by saying, somebody show me that I'm wrong, but we're not willing to hear it because the blame game doesn't work that way. Chaos thrives in a vacuum of goodness. And we need to know that. When we sit and don't tell people, this isn't about you, this isn't about what you want. When we do that, we let chaos thrive. But when we look at people and say, listen, dude, this isn't their fault for wanting to not be shot right? Even if they had a knife in their car, even if they turned their back and didn't answer the police, no one deserves to be shot in the back, right? I, I, and I don't, I'm not saying I agree with any of the protests and that, but no one deserves that, right? So we got to get to that point where we can detach ourselves enough to not play the blame game and to not do that so we can minimize the chaos around events or even the COVID stuff. Like, yeah, if we all wore our masks, this would be over but I can't let that be the guiding thought. I have to instead take, like Ben said, personal accountability to do the right thing so that it doesn't get any, anywhere bigger than that. And I have a responsibility to do that according to chapter 32 and all that's going on to God. And it's in this little character that shows up and I want you to, this is part of your homework, to read it and see it because it's amazing. Um, a character called uh, Elihu who shows up like, this dude just shows up all of a sudden, and he's not been in the, in, the, in the story till now, but he shows up, and he's pretty mad at Job. I'm going to be real with you. He's pretty angry because he sees all this blaming. He sees all this stuff going on and decides this isn't right. Now, a little bit of a teaching moment, a little time out for a teaching moment, um, but I'm going to be a little careful about this. So when the Bible is written, it gets redacted if that makes sense, if you know what that word means. If you don't, basically it means that it gets written down eventually at some point, but that occurred after a lot of years of oral tradition. People taking a story and redacting it, that is taking parts out, maybe adding some other parts, but usually just trimming it down so they can remember it. And in its redactive capacity, things sometimes get put in that aren't original to the story. In Job's case, the story 
we think is intact the way it is. But some scholars believe that because Elihu comes out of nowhere and is the voice of reason on top of that, that either his something that he had said earlier has been eliminated or that he was added later to try to be the voice of reason here. But either way, he kind of comes out of nowhere. And when he comes out of nowhere, he does so to speak not about whose fault it is, not about who's right, whether it's Bill Dad or they don't care who's right over here, right? He's trying to get them to think about God. And this is all the perspective thing I've been talking about. Chaos needs perspective. And so in chaos, we have to go back to God. And that's super hard to do, y'all. I mean, like I told you this morning, I spent a year and a half trying to get back to God and the chaos in my mind and just can't sometimes. I just kind of get lost in the weeds of blaming myself for things. Um, but it's not the way it's supposed to be. Um, Elihu reminds us that we have to be thinking about God because it's a fool's errand to not do that. Um, everyone else plays the blame game in this. Everyone in the world around us, including ourselves, plays that. But hopefully there's always some voice, the Holy Spirit, a prophet, a preacher, some, a friend, a relative who says, dude, God's all that matters. So all the chaos is around you. It's really not a bad, it's not a good, but it is an opportunity to find God. And that's, that's what Elihu says. If you get to that point, it's chapter 32 when you're reading it. He says this, and I, I, just, I just love it. He um, says, Behold, I waited for your words. I listened for your wise sayings while, I, while you searched out what to say. And that's something that we got to really come to grips with there, is that there are people, the Spirit, God, Jesus, they're listening for us. They're sitting here listening for all the wise things we can say while we're searching to find the right way to frame a situation to make it look good for us, right? I gave you my attention, Elihu says, and behold, there was none among you who refuted Job or who answered his words. Beware lest you say we have found wisdom. God may vanquish him, not a man. He has not directed his words against me, and I will not answer him with your speeches, he says. So basically he's saying, you haven't found any reason to refute what Job has said. And he goes on to then refute Job and says, I'm going to open my mouth and my tongue's going to speak speak and my words declare the uprightness of my heart the spirit of god has made me and the breath of the almighty gives me life answer me if you can set your words in order before me take your stand behold i am toward god as you are i too was pinched off for him from a piece of clay i have no fear um, about any of this you've spoken and my ears have heard it it is this behold in this you are not right i will answer you for god is greater than man for God speaks in one way, and in two, though man does not perspeak, perceive it. So Elihu is basically saying, listen, God is above all of this. Everything you think you know, it's not right. And that's where we need to land. If you've ever been in a real chaotic situation, you understand you can't make sense of it in the moment. Like I've said, you all have to get perspective. So we can't blame God for the chaos around us. We can't blame others for the chaos around us. We have to just see it as an opportunity to find God. Elihu, one of the things I highlighted to tell you, um, he basically, it, it, I'm reading it again real quick as I'm talking, and it's not as impactful for how this has gone as I want it to be. But he says the following. If you have understanding, hear this. Listen to what I say. Shall one who hates justice govern? Will you condemn him who is righteous and mighty, who says to a king, worthless one, and to nobles, wicked man, and who shows no partiality to princes, nor regards the rich more than the poor, for they are all the work of his hands. In a moment they die. At midnight the people are shaken and pass away, and the mighty are taken away by no human hand. As Jesus says in a more succinct word version, it rains on the just and the unjust. So there can be no blame. For the chaos around us, if we're being honest, because of that. This brings me to my favorite part of the Bible. I told you we we're going to get to it. 
So we're going to get to it now. And that's part of your homework, by the way. You get all this. It doesn't. It takes maybe 15 minutes to read all this, by the way. We get through all of this. Elihu extols God. He tells, talks about God's greatness and all that he is and all that he does. And he finishes his talk. And then, this is why scholars think, by the way, that it's added. Then God answers Job, who had finished talking. It says, thus ends the words of Job. And then Elihu responds, but then God responds. So they think that probably in the original, God just responded. It's my favorite chapter, probably in all the Bible, but explains what I think about God. So the original question of this day was, is God to blame for the chaos around us? We all want to blame God in a way or assign authority to God for the bad that's around us and hopefully for the good. But ultimately, God isn't to blame for the chaos around us. There's no way for that. The chaos around us is the creation of man and the responsibility of all men and women together. And this is the proof of that. Chapter 38 of <clears throat> Job, and I want you to read it over and over and over again. I'm going to read you the whole thing. Well, not maybe not the whole thing. Not the whole thing. Half of it because time's running short. Chapter 38, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, which is interesting because there wasn't a whirlwind before. It was just Job suffering and his friends. So there was chaos already. And then this big chaos came. This whirlwind comes and Job, the Lord answers Job out of this whirlwind and says, who is it that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man, I will question you, and you will make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out of the womb? When I made the clouds its garment, and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed limits for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far you shall come, and no farther, and here you, your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began, and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth, and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked, their light is withheld and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare if you know all of this. Where is the way to the dwelling of light? And where is the place of darkness that you may take, its to take it to its territory and that you may discern the paths to its home? You know, for you were born then, and the number of your days is great. Now, I know we don't like to think of God as being kind of snarky, right? But this is full-on snarky God saying, where, where are you? If you know so much, where were you? And that is us, church. We need to get to the point where we can look at every situation from COVID to politics to me sitting in this room right here with y'all and understand that chaos is the creation of man, that we have the choice in every situation to make the best of it and to not call it chaos and just assign it a value of it's a situation. Or we can play the blame game, which always leads back to God. There's no other way around it because if we blame Jerry Falwell or Jim Baker, we're blaming everybody beneath them and we're blaming the God who created them because God could have stopped it whenever. So ultimately there can be no blame game because we weren't there at the beginning of all things. Only God was there. So what do we do? What's our, what can be our response to God? Well, I'll tell you what Job's was, by the way. If you, when you read it, you go on and we get to chapter 40. And again, one of my favorite moments in all scripture, the Lord said to Job, shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He, he, he who argues with God, let him answer it. Or in our context, shall a blame game person, someone who's assigning blame everywhere else, 
can someone who judges everybody else on the planet contend with the Almighty who created them? And if you're arguing with God, then, then answer it. Tell me. Then Job answered the Lord, chapter, uh, chapter 40, verse 3 says, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once, and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. Now, when you read that, I want you to, to let that sink in. For the, the quality of being quiet is a quality we sometimes don't take advantage of, especially in chaos. Um, one of the things that I learned in the military was that you always need to communicate. You know, in a firefight, to be quiet is probably, the, probably not a good thing. You're probably not helping anybody. If you're not pointing out where fire's coming from or doing stuff, you're just, you're not being helpful. But that kind of chaos is different from chaos like in my house now, or chaos in your cars or in your homes or at work. Sometimes less is more. And Job has a rare moment of insight God doesn't take, take to it that well. I'll go ahead and spoil that for you. Spoiler alert, as you're reading it, God's still mad. He still, he still contends with Job after that. But sometimes we just need to stop and to let the chaos continue to happen around us and to kind of rise above it in a very quiet way, knowing that it's not God's fault or anyone else's fault. And the only way we can really do that, I think, is to know that there is no blame and to want only good to come out of it. So how do you think we should, how do you think we can do that? What's the best way in your chaotic situations in your mind to get to that point where you can be quiet? Like I'm going to do now. It doesn't have to be right or wrong, just what you think. How can you get quiet? What's something you can do to make that happen? Prayer. Prayer? It's a good one. We'll come back to that, by the way. It's a really good one. Solitude. Solitude? Self-reflection. Self-reflection. It's all good. What? Go ahead. Anybody else? I was going to say, just practice being quiet. Be yeah. intentional about it. Listening. What am I listening? Oh, nice. That's a great one. Yeah. Pausing before you actually react. All good things. One of my, the only evangelicalism that I, that I carry with me. Um, it's by your actions. What was that? By your actions. By your actions. Yeah, very good. Um, but one of the only evangelical things that I kind of keep with me from my evangelical days is the sort of acts prayer thing. You all ever heard of acts prayer, right? Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplications, right? You have this order to prayer, but it's not really the acts part, even though I do tend to do it. Um, it's the confession part. Everything you've said leads to that point. So everything we do has a reason. It's, it's in the matrix, y'all. It's a real thing. Um, so go watch it and don't blame me for the bad language. But everything that happens, happens for a reason. Every moment you have, every thought you have, every encounter you have, it literally leads you down a path that would never be there had you never had that moment. So everything happens for a reason. It doesn't mean that God's ordaining it. Don't, don't mishear that. I don't mean that. I mean it happens and there's a reason that, it, that results from it happening. So when you are quiet and self-reflective and listening around you and you're praying and you're just surrounding yourself with this practice of action of self-discipline and listening and quiet, you're going to get to confession. It's going to happen where you say, wow, I didn't really need to be upset about that guy cutting me off. 
had I not been upset, the rest of my day would have gone better. And that is an important moment to get to for the Christians. Had Job been able to have self-reflection and, and confession and quiet, and his friends not bombarding him, it's likely he would have gotten to a confessional point pretty quickly and that he and God could have gotten over this and the chaos could have abated even quicker. But he couldn't because of all the mess going around. So confession has to be part of our response to chaos, to say, I am part of this. I'm Grandma Smith who gave some money to that. And that's okay. That doesn't make me a bad person. I was part of the problem, but I don't have to be in the future. We need to practice confession. And I'm going to kind of close with a one last pilot thing. I'm sorry I have so many pilot things. It's going on in my life. And so it's, it's, it's a thing. One of those the, one of the best things about being a pastor is that you're, for me, the best quality about being a pastor is that you're supposed to integrate things around you into modern paradigms to say this is what God's saying through them. But for me right now, it happens to be flying. I'm sure it'll be a lot of baby stuff in the next coming years. I'm sorry. It's just the way it is. But every time I get in a plane, I have to enter confessional. Every time. It's one of the hallmarks of a good pilot and mostly a pilot's gonna to live to fly another day. And we do something called I am safe. It's a real easy thing to remember um, as a starting place that says, you know, it's, it's illness, medications, stress. Um, there's an A in there, right? Alcohol, fatigue, and environment. All those things are, you ask yourself, am I sick? Do I have an illness? Am I on any medications? Um, am I stressed out about something? Do I have to get somewhere quickly? Um, if I had alcohol in the last eight hours, am I tired? How's the weather around me? Am I suitable and fit to fly in this weather around me? If any of those are negative, you can't fly. You just don't fly. And that, if we could just integrate that in our own personal ways to our responses to chaos, we'd be so much better off. So much better off to say, okay, what triggers me? And how do I respond to it? And the response is easy. The response just has to be quiet, like both from people and to people, giving and receiving, confession, and then thanksgiving to God. So like, I don't know if you can make QCT out of that. It doesn't make any sense. Anyway, but come up with something that integrates those elements where you can slow down to get perspective and quiet and then confess to God what you're feeling and then give thanks to him for the opportunity to feel it and the situation and see where it goes from there. That way you're not blaming God for chaos and you're checking yourself before you wreck yourself. Wiggy, wiggy, what? Sorry, I'm a dork. But I'm chaotic good. That's for sure. Usually. What do you guys think? What are your thoughts on all that? I don't know how many of you have heard of the thing called control theory, but I learned it from Tammy. Um, and the thing is, the premise is the only thing you can control is yourself. Ah. So I think, you know, in matters in my life, in times of chaos, and, you know, really, compared to Joe, I haven't had any chaos. I, you know, really. Um, then I had to look at myself and say, okay, center yourself and focus, you know, quiet yourself with God. You'll get through this, right? I think chaos is most often exacerbated by like the people around Job who thought they knew more than anyone and felt like they had to put in their opinion and felt like they had to be heard. And, um, you know, I really respected those guys for coming and sitting with Job for seven days, right? sitting there being quiet but then they had to open their mouth <laughs> and sometimes i think um chaos would abate or at least ease up a little bit if sometimes the people around me would just shut up and of course you can't use the s word you have to be nice right but but most often i'm telling you, i'm trying to be more and more like michelle <laughs> but the truth is is that sometimes chaos is just made so much worse by these all these voices that are surrounding us, telling us 
how we're supposed to think and what we're supposed to choose and what we're supposed to do and where we're supposed to go, you know? And what I respect about Job is he came to the place where he just told, you know, the confession with God, right? You know, God, I'm mad. I don't understand. I can't find you. What's going on? And then most of the time, God does what he did here. He, he refocuses us. He recenters us, right? Um, but we, that's a, it's hard sometimes to get out of yourself, right? Mm -hmm. And especially if you're one of those people that, that you don't really, really bother God. <laughs> you know, so he gave me a mind. I'm supposed to fix this myself, you know, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to bother him with this. Not like God already doesn't know your confusion and your chaos, your frustration, your anger, your bitterness. He already knows all that. He kind of wants you to tell him. But then you have to be prepared for what he comes back and says, Oh, yeah, well, how about thinking about these things? Yeah. And confession reminds us, I think, that we can't change the world. We just can't, not in that way that we want to. You hear me say every week that you can change the world. You can. You can change one person at a time, change the world in a positive way. But you can't make dumb stop being dumb. You can't make, you know, Mistakes stop being mistakes. All you can do is handle you. But it starts with confession. One of the greatest strengths of the Catholic Church, in my opinion, is confession. And we don't do it enough. Um, it is a wonderful perspective giver in a chaotic situation. What else, y'all? You've been quiet tonight. I've talked a lot. I'm sorry I didn't have you read. I just thought it'd be easier and honestly with the with the kind of situation in my house trying to think of ways to integrate people in a variable way it didn't work tonight i was like i'll just read it <laughs> i had it all highlighted in mind like i'll just flip through it and read it and it'd be fine so sorry about that didn't mean to talk so much but well jeff i think with confession a lot of people don't want to admit what they've done they think they can hide it from god but you can't hide anything from god but if you speak it, then you are responsible for what you have done. And sometimes you don't want to admit that you've not been living or doing something that is in God's will. Yeah. But you always feel better, right? Am I the only one that thinks that? Like when you confess something, it might not be immediate, but you feel better like soon after. Well, you just take the power, whatever you're hiding, you, when you bring it out into the light, you take the power away from it. Yeah. Even if it's chaos, right? Even if you're yeah. causing the chaos, like, ugh. I've never, so my girls, that they are typical girls. I hope that I, that I make that clear to everyone. My kids are just kids. Um, they mess up a lot. And I want you to know that I rarely punish them for messing up. Sorry, but I always punish them for lying. Like badly punish them for lying. But if they break something, if they hit each other, I make them talk. We think about it. We, we discuss the good and bad, but I always start with what, what did you do? Just tell me what you did. And if it's the truth, I reward them for that. And I think that's the way God is. If we just, you, we're gonna mess up y'all. You're gonna break those glasses in your mom's cupboard right? You're going to tape it together, maybe. That's, that's a bad idea, but you're going to try, right? But the confession part takes it away. Like, I don't know any parent that would say that their kid doesn't matter more to them than that glass or something else. I always tell you, people matter more than stuff. And if we can feel that as humans, oh my gosh, God's like up there. He's got to be laughing at us in a, in a loving way. Like, Dude, what are you doing? Like, just tell me what you did. You'll feel better. <laughs> yeah, when you try to hide it, it just keeps it getting bigger and bigger and bigger and heavier and heavier and heavier till you just can't function anymore. And yep, more chaotic. Yes. That cut becomes infected and turns to gangrene and you lose a limb. Mm -hmm. And so you can even put this, and I'm going to try to be very, very non-political in all of this, but in the COVID response that we see around this, right? 
we all have a thing that we want out of it, right? Whether it's mass, no mass, work, no work, I don't care what it is. We all have an angle that we want to go. But until we confess that it's probably a thing that is not optimal for all people to get sick, where we don't want anyone to get sick, until we can confess that, we can't take away the chaos of our 75 opinions. But when we all can unify on it's a pandemic and it's real, like that, it, that's it. When we can all get on that, then we can move on and say, well, we can have a different opinion and still get to a place where we all come out of this better. But we can't do that when there's chaos. And you can only get out of chaos by gaining perspective and then confessing your role in that chaos around us. So when, preach that uh, to the world, please. When you mentioned confession, I was thinking about growing up with the monster twin brother that I have. Um, and if you ever found out that I did something wrong, he tried to hold it over me. You got to do this, or I'm going to tell mom. You got to do this, or I'm going to tell mom. And, and finally, I, I heard it in a sermon, you know, like a kid. And so I, I just decided he was having no power over me. And I went over and I told my mom, you know, accepted the consequences and went on with it. But I didn't let my brother have any power over me. And that's yep. one of, and you know, spiritually speaking, Satan has no power over us, right? The others who want to create chaos in our world have no power over us if we're confessing, right? It it takes that away from them. Yep. Absolutely right. What else, y'all? What else you got? Any, any confessions? Jason, did you finish the dishes? You gonna confess that? Still working on it. I, I've moved on to supper now, but I'm listening. Oh, that's okay. I'm but glad you're cooking. From, yeah, we finished making, eating you, our supper. Do it. <laughs> they finished, finished eating, eating I haven't our had supper. supper yet. I haven't ah. had supper yet. It, it will be. It will be uh, peanut butter crackers and milk and cheese. Cheerios. Cheerios. Nice. Ben, what you eating? Uh, pizza. I'm going to get pizza after this. Oh, my gosh. I'm so jealous. Like, what? where are you going to get pizza? There's a, a pizza place on campus. It's not very good, but it's it's part of the meal plan. So. But it's still no pizza. No Little Caesars. <laughs> no Little Caesars. I'm jealous. I love a pizza. That might be the first youth dinner we do when we get back it's pizza we're gonna go to piccolo's and eat pizza till we pass out is that in lenore yeah yes oh yeah Chicago mm -hmm. style pizza it's really good it's really good it's gonna be a good day all right well wheel of prayer give me hair I don't know. I couldn't think of any good rhyme for that. You got to share your screen, bud. Oh, man. Here we go again. More. I don't know how to do this. Meeting settings. Nope. Nope. Not any of that. Go to the click share on. content. Share content um, area. I'm going to click on Michelle. Participants. Michelle. Go to share content area. Uh, make host. Here you go. You are the host. You're muted. You can't be a muted host. Yes, I can. Oh, here we go. Oh man, there's a lot of there's a lot of stress in this moment. I don't know why Kate's on there. Ah, it's Ben. Ben. Hey, Michelle, you should have another tab open. Um, that's, that's not enough. <laughs> if it had been Kate, I'd have done it. Sorry. No, that's, that's nice of you. That's, anyway, Ben. Thank you, Jonathan. Ben. All right. Dear Lord, thank you for us getting together today. Um, even though it's not over the best, um, best platform, we'd much rather be together. Uh, in person. Uh, thank you for
for still allowing us to be together worshiping you. And thank you uh, for helping Jeff with this th sermon and um, help him make another great one next week. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> thank you for the support. That's awesome support. I feel better with that. I'll try my best to make it adequate. That's all I always do. Get to that level. Kind of like, you know, the Attack of the Clones. I just want to get to that level. Not fan of menace. Just get to Attack of the Clones. <laughs> Sorry. All in God's hands anyways. That's right. Well, y'all have a wonderful week, wherever you go, whatever you do. We'll see you when we can. And you as well. Thanks. Thank Praying you. Praying for tomorrow. Thank you. Mark five.